Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. The impact of the collapse of banks and insurance companies and financial institutions and even governmental institutions is wreaking havoc on people's life, their families. I couldn't think, for example, of the United States ever being threatened with the possibility of losing Ford Motor Company or Chrysler. It's almost impossible to think that. They said Ford itself employed over half a million people. They collapse, which has been the talk this past week. That's a whole lot of families. You multiply that by the average of three in the family. It's 1.5 million people in trouble. 1.2 million jobs have already been lost by the end of December in the United States. And in our own Caribbean islands here, we depend mostly on tourism as our major industry. And that includes the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Barbados, St. Kitts, St. Thomas, St. Lucia, Grenada, Trinidad. And 80% of our tourists comes from the United States, which means that if they implode, we explode. The impact that has also on Europe, which also is experiencing the same shaking of the institutions, is having a frightening effect on the European market. When I was in England a few days ago, they were predicting up to 500,000 jobs being lost by the end of November, this, this month, in England alone. England is one of the driving engines of Europe. Germany was laying off up to 30 to 40,000 people per month. France, as you know, have been trying to solve their own problem by becoming more socialist in their response, by buying up more of the private sector to save people's jobs and save companies. Our own prime minister this past week gave answers that frightened me because he said, we can't do anything about it. I've been sharing with you the past few weeks about how to respond to crisis. And one of the things I want us to note in the book of Genesis chapter 1, please turn there, verse 26. It says, and God said, let us make man in our own image and our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock of the field and over everything that grows in the earth and everything that creeps upon the ground. The principal assignment of mankind given to us by God is the dominion over earth's resources. Do you agree with that? Is that what you just read? That's what God said. Let them have dominion over fish, birds, cattle, livestock, plants, and all that creeps on the earth. Let them dominate that. So the responsibility of mankind is the management and 
the preserving the development of earth's resources the divine goal of mankind is the extension of the culture of heaven on earth which is a culture of plenty and abundance you know the story of John visiting heaven briefly and in the book of revelations John writes about what he felt when he went to heaven he went to the home country and John didn't know what to say he was so overwhelmed so he started saying things figuratively he said it seemed like the the streets were paved with gold and it seemed like the things that appeared to be gates were made out of pearls and he said the river seemed to be filled with crystal I mean the guy was so overwhelmed he said the whole place is full of too much and Jesus said when you pray pray thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth just like God intended for earth to be filled with plenty abundance the divine strategy of God therefore was to dominate earth and make it an abundant place let me suggest to you how did God intend for man to dominate the earth I want you to read your Bible with me for a second please look at the book of Genesis again chapter 1 is important for us to review for a second in chapter 1 God said let us make man in our own image and let them have dominion now God never gives you instructions without strategy hey boy say instruction with strategy when God gives you instructions he always gives you the strategy how is man supposed to dominate verse 28 God blessed them and said be fruitful and increase and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that is upon the ground verse 29 then God said Adam I have given you seed seed bearing fruit plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has fruit has seed in it very important God's plan was management of that beautiful resource the power of management is the assignment of God for man management is the ultimate plan of God and we must understand how management works look at chapter 2 if you will this gets a little deep here and read with me verse 5 when the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens there was no shrub of the field that had yet appeared on the earth and there was no plant on the earth why because the Lord God had not yet sent rain on the earth everybody take a deep breath one more time I want to teach you about the secret to thriving in times of crisis it's right here in Genesis the Bible says God didn't allow anything to grow and didn't send rain on the earth for anything to grow and the question is why 
Let's take a look at it. The next verse says, because there was no man to work. For there was no, what? Man to work. For there was no man to work. Okay. God had a lot of power in the earth, but he refused to let the power spring forth. And he tells us why. He, he didn't allow any rain to come yet. It tells us God prevented rain. Why? Because there was no man to work the ground. Can I suggest to you that God will prevent growth if there is no management? The word work here means manage. God will not allow development where there is no management. God will withhold progress where there is no management. God will not allow anything to expand unless he has a man or a woman who will manage that development. Write this down, please. Management is the primary goal of man mankind. So whatever you fail to manage, you will lose. Say that with me. Whatever you fail to manage, you will lose. God prevents growth where there's no management. God's primary measure then of trusting you is management. God won't trust you with any more than you can manage. And during these crisis seasons, God will give resources to the managers. If you do not manage what you have, you will lose what you have. And if you don't learn to manage effectively, God won't let anything come to you. Write this down. God will give to effective management. God will what? Give to effective management. God will not allow rain to come if there's no manager. He won't allow development to come if there's no manager. He won't allow any resources to grow where there's no manager. So management attracts resources. Write it down. Management attracts resources. And this, therefore, is the greatest moment for management. No money left planet Earth. No matter what they tell you. The billions are still on Earth. No money went to the moon or Mars or Jupiter. All the gold and silver is here somewhere. And there are billions of dollars somewhere. I remember reading the Bible when I was a kid. I was shocked as a teenager when I read the verse in Isaiah. God says, I know where the secret riches of darkness lie. Money don't leave earth, it goes into hiding. <laughs> And it will come out from hiding when it sees a human who is managing effectively. God will not give to you what you pray for. He will give to you what you can manage. <laughs> we love to pray for things. And God protects them from us. Let me say it slow. We love to pray for things. And God protects the things from us. That's why you ain't winning the lottery. Wasting your money. <laughs> he protects the lottery money from you. Because you can't even manage tithing. Now I'm not talking to you now. I'm talking to the person behind you. Don't take it personal. You keep asking God for a bigger house and you ain't keeping the apartment clean. You asking God for a car and the motorbike is dirty. In other words, God is watching how you manage what you have now and you're praying for something that you can't even manage. You 
know, there's one thing about stealing. If you are a little thief, a small thief, then the spirit of stealing is upon you. <laughs> oh dear. We got tiny thieves. <laughs> we got people who steal a little right now. And they are experts at small stealing. So they get a hundred dollars and they thief God's ten. Thief. That means to steal in the Bahamas. They steal the ten and they do it so effectively that when they ask God for a thousand, God says, mm, 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 mm. you're so good at stealing ten, you're going to take the hundred. And then you pray for ten thousand. God says, no, no, no. I, I, I can't give you ten thousand because you're still stealing the ten. You are an expert thief. Jesus said in Luke 16, if you cannot be trusted with little, who will trust you with much? If you cannot manage little, how can you manage much? Crisis will reveal who's a bad manager. Look at your neighbor right now and smile. Don't say just smile with them. I'm going to say it again. Times of crisis will reveal who's been a bad manager all these years. They're going to be the biggest beggars. Managers save. Managers get value for dollar. Managers use their resources effectively. And if you didn't do those kinds of things, this period will expose you. And the problem is, God will make sure you still don't get anything. Because wasting with little will waste much. I hope you hear me today. You see, the kingdom principal key for security in crisis is management. God gave man dominion. He gave man management over the earth and man was given rulership over the earth. Now, everybody say rulership. Rulership is not ownership. Rulership is not ownership. Management is always responsibility for someone else's resources. Management is responsibility always for someone else's resources so God told Adam here's my planet dominate it you don't own it you manage it and what has happened on our planet today is result of man's management or mismanagement and all humans are man ages in the literature the word manager has man in it it's the age of man. It's the age where God gave man the responsibility to manage his resources. So whatever we misuse on this planet is a direct lack of accountability to God. Whether it is pollution or destruction of trees or animals or rivers or destruction of property, of the abuse of our bodies or the abuse of other people, this is mismanagement. And in the kingdom of God, no one owns anything. Everything is management. Accountability, therefore, is a natural result of management. Accountability means that what you have ain't yours. you got to report to someone else. And this is why effective management in God's kingdom will always determine the amount of your resources. The better you manage, the more God gives you. The better you manage, the more God gives you. The less you manage, the less God gives you. It's not how long, how deep you pray. It's how well you manage. I remember quoting with you two weeks ago, and those who are here visiting us today, please go to the bookstore and tell them you want the whole series on management. Because if you understand it, you will make it through the crisis. I was giving a quote last week. You know, Solomon says, the wealth that the wicked has really belongs to the righteous <laughs> so Solomon says the Lord spoke to him and told him this he's speaking on behalf of the Holy Spirit he says the wealth of the wicked is later for the righteous the wealth of the wicked is really laid up for the righteous wait a minute the wealth of the wicked 
is really laid up for the righteous. No, wait a minute. The wealth that the wicked has really belongs to the righteous. Who said that? God. How does God know they have it? <laughs> Whoever manages attracts the resources. I heard Donald Trump on Larry King the other night said, he said, this is the greatest time for me. I'm buying up everything. <laughs> Things are cheap now. I'm buying up every building, everything. In other words, ain't not, not everybody having problems. Those who are good managers are having a heyday. How come the righteous are employed by the wicked? We are so quick to say, my God owns the sheep on a thousand hills. My God shall supply. That's why I go in straight to the wicked and work eight hours today to get some of it. Our theology ain't working. The reason why the wicked has it is because the wicked is an effective manager. God doesn't give resources to people. He gives resources to managers. He allows the rain to rain where there's a man to work to match the ground. And so the heart of God is looking for management. I want to give you the seven ways we talked about real quick. Write this down. Seven ways to manage your crisis. And this is for those of us who need a little bit of help. Number one, determine what you need. Not what you want. This is the time for the next five years, they say, this crisis will be around. For five years. So my first advice to you is list the things you need. Most of what you want, you don't need. Do you need to eat lunch out to a restaurant every day? Then cut it out. Take a sandwich to, to, to your job. Do you need to buy Christmas presents for every cousin, auntie, nephew, uncle? Let me tell you something. Not this Christmas, if you're smart. <laughs> buy everybody a bottle of water. Just say in the name of Jesus. <laughs> give them some life say amen anyhow amen. you need this ain't no time for you to try and impress nobody with no money you are going broke if you don't identify your needs the bible says my god shall supply all of your what not what you want number two if you're going to make it through the crisis you should only acquire what you need. This is the time where you need to make some very strategic decisions. You need to study your resources that you have and to find out what do I need right now. That's all I need and acquire what you need. Anything extra is bad management right now. This is why companies are shutting down and laying off and going into bankruptcy why they're cutting fat they, they they realize some there's some things they don't need there's some people that they can live without for the next five years and they're sending people off home they're managers number three decide not to live beyond your ability everybody said decide you got to make a decision today that you will not live above your means. You know, I, I, I love these people who sing these songs like, uh, God is more than enough. Now, I know he's Shama and everything, but Shama told the disciples, pick up every crumb. Wait, 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 I'm, I'm confused. I thought she was God more than enough. Yeah, it's more than enough. But whatever the more is, pick it up. Hmm. Comprende? 
All right, y'all didn't get that. Let me try it again. He fed 5,000 people. He said to the disciples, go around now and pick up every crumb and bring the baskets to me. He's more than enough. They ate their fill and they even had enough to drop on the ground. He said, pick up what they dropped. I want to count the baskets. God is not a waster. The temptation to consume everything you have is demonic. The temptation to spend all your money is demonic. Collect your baskets. Give an account of your baskets. This is no time for you to waste any resources. Number four, withdraw the unnecessary. It's a tough one. You know, there's some things now that are necessary, you know. <laughs> like maybe, you know, uh, like I'm looking at all of my subscriptions the other day, going through my files, all my subscriptions. I'm subscribing to a lot of different, you know, companies and magazines and material. I say, you know, for the next five years, I got to kind of shave this down. So I'm writing them letters saying, uh, I, uh, I, I don't want to sign up anymore for this year. Why? Uh, uh, I'm withdrawing. This is not necessary for me to live. You got to identify which you must withdraw from. There's some clubs you are part of. That you got to pay some stuff to stay a part of them. You got to count them clubs and check them out. See if you need them to live. There's some people that you've been supporting. You got to review them again. And see if they are necessary for you to live. There's some people living in your house who are old enough to go to work for themselves. Yeah. Review those situations and you may need to withdraw and say, look, you ain't getting no more free food until you bring something in this house. You are 42 years old, buddy. <laughs> hey, boy, say, withdraw the unnecessary. Withdraw. Say it loud, tell your spirit, hear it. Withdraw. One more time. Withdraw the unnecessary. I want you to go home and do an assessment of your life. This is serious business. The hotel where we are having the convention this week has cut down the staff because the rooms are not filled. They are so happy for us being there. We are the greatest blessing to the country right now in the name of Jesus. Praise God. But you see, they realize they got to cut down the unnecessary. Atlantis shut down a whole tower the other day. Shut it down. Why? Well, based on the conditions, that's unnecessary to keep them lights on. Management demands hard decisions. Number five, delay major projects. Number six, value your possessions. That means plan to keep the car longer and delay the purchase of the new one. I know you had planned to buy one for Christmas. Here's the announcement. Keep the Toyota. Why? This ain't no time to impress me. New car and no gasoline. Don't be fooled. Keep your Toyota. That's management. This ain't no atmosphere for you to impress nobody. Clean that old bike and shine up that old car and tell God, I know you a shama, but you told me to collect the baskets. I'm telling you, a lot of folks going to be begging. And they can be the ones who quote in scriptures like this. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed. Come on some bread, brother. 
I have never seen who? The righteous. See, you got to make sure you're lined up. But I'm teaching right now the word of God. The word of God says that he who is diligent in his affairs will prosper. Diligent means you manage every penny. Don't quote no scripture to God. I've never seen like God said, but you ain't righteous, so you're going to beg some bread the next three years because you did not manage what I gave you. Manage. No new clothes this Christmas. Lord, that's a Bahamian curse. I can hear it now. Pastor Miles, you're cursing me. No. I said no new clothes. Take them to the laundry, get them shiny. You ain't impressing me. I'm serious about this. We got this attitude that, well, you know, it's Christmas. You need a new thing, a new dress for this one and that. Listen, let me tell you something. Manage, please. Value your possessions. And number seven, save. Everybody say save. save. Boys, saints don't save. Wicked people save. That's why the wicked got the righteous money. Save. People say to me, I cannot save. You'll be amazed how well you can save. But your lifestyle that you've become habitually attached to doesn't allow you to save. You need to change your lifestyle. There's a book called The Automatic Millionaire. I read the book in one sitting. It's a powerful book. And the book was about how to become a millionaire without feeling it. I started doing what the book said years ago. And guess what? The book is right. The book is right. And the book is talking about little things like stop drinking coffee and put the money in the bank. Two dollars for coffee. Every day, 11 o'clock, you keep drinking. Two o'clock, straight to Starbucks. Starbucks is doing fine. You broke. <laughs> Five days a week, two dollars for a cup of coffee, or is it three now? Is fifteen dollars? Fifty or oh, four dollars? It's five in the Bahamas. Lord have mercy, Jesus. That's twenty dollars a week, eighty dollars a month, nine hundred sixty dollars a year just on coffee. How about twenty years times nine is one eighty thousand dollars just on coffee? Hey boys, they say it. Say it loud. Say it. I saw Joseph standing in front of Pharaoh saying, Pharaoh, look, the Lord says there's going to be crisis in this country. There's going to be an economic collapse. Pharaoh says, what should we do? David said, I mean, Joseph said, save the grain. He had to fight people to not touch that grain for three years. He had to fight to save. You know, Joseph could have prayed, Dear Lord, since thou loving servant is in Egypt, thou canst show Pharaoh thy great hand by allowing food to drop from the sky in Egypt as I pray. I will wave my hand upon this, the desert of Egypt and the people shall eat for three and a half years of famine, Lord, that they may believe in Jehovah. So here goes, Lord. Let man come, Lord, and show Pharaoh that you are God. God says, no, tell them to save. Are you with me? He said, you safe. Let me tell you something about giving too. Give with, dis give with discretion. Not everyone that asks you deserves to get it. That includes family. The Bible says, give with discretion. Boy, I read that years ago. That blessed me. That means I got to study who asking me <laughs> to see if this is legitimate. Save, preserve, conserve. Turn the lights off. Why? That's God's current. Manage it. 
tell the dog you eaten one meal a day now. You can bark all you want. Oh, you're laughing. Dogs getting treated better than people. Send the dog to the, to the, to the human, humane society to keep them for me. The dog cost me $15 a week, man. And I mean, the people in the Bahamas spending that kind of money on dogs. I'm like, what are you doing? And they're so proud. I just think like, you proud? <laughs> Who let the dogs out? Carl, are you guilty? What, 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 what I saw in your start? Uh, don't, don't, don't touch that. And your wife next to you? Now you got a dog. <laughs> you got a dog. Okay. Yeah, you know, people, they're not conserving. You see, no time. I can see them dogs laugh and say, boy, I eating good and she eating bad. <laughs> Conserve. You got to protect what you have. Let me show you something here. It's very important. I call it the money mentality. Read this out loud for me, please. Proverbs 30, verse 24. Read. Four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Save. Look at this one. I love this one. In the book of Proverbs 13, verse 7, read it loud together. Go. One man pretends to be rich, definitely from the Bahamas, definitely from the Bahamas. Read again. One man pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Now, you know, that's right down the alley of the Bahamians. Oh, yeah. They got a Rolls Royce parked in the front of a one-room house. A satellite bigger than the bedroom on top of the roof. Man, this don't make no sense. They pretended to be rich. <laughs> They don't want you to know where they're going home. They, they park in front of my house for a while. Until you leave, then they go to their house. You know, Pretending to be rich. It's in the Bible. He said, look, don't try to impress nobody. All your girlfriends buying that style. Hey, this next three years, no style for me, baby. I can serve him. I'm a manager. I want God to bless me with more. I'm going to manage this blouse. Look at the last part of it. Uh, it says what? Pretend to be poor. The rich what? Pretend to be poor. You don't know who rich in this place. I'm telling you. If I tell you the folks who got the wealth, you won't even know them. And the folks who ain't got nothing, deck right. You know, when you're used to nothing, then you won't put on everything to impress the people that you got something, even though you ain't got nothing. See right there in the verse? Another pretends to be what? Poor, yet has great wealth. A wealthy person doesn't need to show it. Money is a mentality. Look at this verse. Proverbs 13, 11. Write this down. Read it loud. Go. Dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money how? Little by little by little by Starbucks. <laughs> it's in the Bible. It grows. Compound interest is the most powerful interest on the earth. Do you know that everybody in this room, every person in this room was already a millionaire? Everybody. Guaranteed. Some of you are multi-millionaires long time and cannot find a cent. If you counted the dollars you spent for the last 20 years, you was a millionaire more than twice. Average person. He that gathers little by little that takes management to control that you know what it is i mean i've seen it friends you know I, I, i've seen the temptation where you started saving and now you get ten thousand dollars in an account and boy all the demons in hell start visiting you in the night and then all kind of dreams you start having you start seeing perfume <laughs> european cruise all kind of stuff you start seeing 
You got to control that. The ants saves in summer because in winter there's no food. Winter is about to hit the earth. Where's your stash? It's kingdom. Here's a thought. Genesis 2 9. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. A river he had watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there there was a separate there was they were, they were separated rather into four headwaters, the four different rivers. Then the, I'm reading the Bible now. He says, the gold of that land is good. The aromatic resin and the onyx, they are also there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is in the Bible, Genesis. God's talking to Adam. <laughs> Look at that verse. He's talking to Adam. He says, Adam, uh, first of all, the first thing God showed Adam was water. He said, there's water. In the garden. Some of y'all are going to get revelation right now about how you're going to become a big businessman, woman. First thing God showed Adam is what? Water. Second, he showed him what? Gold. Third, he showed him what? Resin. Fourth, he showed him what? Onyx. Okay, let's take a look at these four things. It's interesting. You know, there are five foundations of wealth. God told Adam, I give you every fruit for food. Then he says, I give you water. And then he says, I give you gold. And I give you resin. And then I give you onyx. Anyone who deals in these four commodities will be rich on the earth. I was thinking the other day, when they talk about oil prices, <laughs> they says, in the next few years, we'll be choosing between whether to fill our tanks or fill our stomachs. You gotta make a choice. Which one would you choose? Which one would you choose? See, it's amazing, eh? That means the people who sell food, who grow food, are going to become the wealth of the earth. It began with agriculture. The number one power of society is agriculture. We keep moving away from it. See, you cannot eat a blackberry. And so we keep going out to a $200 iPhone. God says, look, you don't understand it. You get your iPhone, but you ain't got no food. You could either have a valley full with vegetables or a silicone valley. Which valley do you want? Beautiful advice God gave Adam. He began with agriculture. Once you have your agricultural foundation laid, he said, now you focus on water. Why? You got to water the agriculture. Those who sell water today will always be rich. I'm trying to give you some advice, son. Build yourself on osmosis plan. Reverse osmosis plan. And start bottling water anywhere in the world. You're going to be all right. I guarantee it. Why? God told Adam, there are four rivers. Your body is 87% water. You cannot live without water. So whoever buys water, who sells water, will always be rich. Your body... It's made of dirt. So every vegetable and every fruit is dirt. So whoever sells fruit and vegetables will always be rich. Two things you need to live. Water and dirt. We keep going after stuff that people don't need. That's why they can shut it down. Look at the companies that are collapsing. You don't need a car. So force it up. We lay in a 40,000 job. Go find food.
What do you want to study, son? Well, I want to study what will give me a lot of money. Because, okay, read the list. Start with food. Then water. After you get enough food and water, he said, now you can start digging in the ground for the rest of the wealth. What's in the, what's in the ground? Gold and oil. What we've done is we've made three and two, three and four, one and two. We've made the first one the last one. There's no land to grow anymore. Look at America, man. The soil is so messed up. God told Israel, He said, when you enter the land of Canaan, listen to God. He says, let the land rest every seven years. Do you know what they've done in the United States? They said, look, we ain't got time to let the land rest for a year because we're losing money. Yeah, come on. So they began to put artificial nutrients in the earth, chemicals, and now you got this food that's killing you. Yeah. And God said, look, let the land rest naturally. It'll restore itself with nutrients. They say, no, we need money every year. The greed is destroying the country. Right. Give God a hand for being smart. So we got yellow corn that ain't supposed to be yellow. And believe me, the apple ain't that red. They put stuff in the water that they put in the apple tree that makes it red. And that carrot ain't that orange. I promise you, that's coloring in the carrot. And it's killing you. You got cancer at 35 in your breast because they won't let the land rest for one year. That's bad management. And God's taking away life. See, whatever you mismanage, you lose. Young people, listen to me. Go into the food business. Go into the water business. Haiti, man. How many millions in Haiti? Nine million people. Man, they need to drink. And the number one problem in Haiti is water. You know that. The mud and the muck they're drinking. If you are smart as a Haitian, you go back there and you invest your money in a reverse osmosis system and just bottle the water and watch God bless you. But we'd rather send money and it goes to some corrupt politician's pocket. Look at God's plan. Now, ladies, listen to me carefully. I, I, I can leave you on this because I know you can, you can pull to me with a rock. But the last one is diamonds. God got it at the bottom. You listening, sweetie? Okay. God put rock <laughs> at the bottom. This ain't no time for you to go go into no jewelry store. Those who sell jewelry, forgive me, but I can't chew diamond, man. I can't drink no pearl. Come on, somebody. Help me here a little bit. Somebody say amen. Say amen from a job. I know you don't want to say amen. <laughs> we spend $10,000 on a diamond and then put it in a drawer. God got it on the bottom. He says you do that when you get food already got water you strike some oil you got some gold you got enough to put some decorations on so there'll be a lot of questions now you know going on this Christmas you know you married folks so what you want for Christmas so what you want for Christmas <laughs> that over <laughs> buy them a bottle of water Give God a big hand for water. Praise God. <laughs> Everybody say manage God's resources. God gave Adam a priority list. There's no time to go buy no pearls for your girlfriend. You broke, she broke. The worst company in the world is another broke person. Your lady, look, look at your faces. Leave my diamonds alone. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You are not poor, ladies. If you were to assess the value of the stuff in your bedroom, 
And now's the time to do it. Assess your possessions. Because they don't, they can't help you right now. This is time to sell assets that are decorations. You're getting ready to go into crisis. You got to offload. You got to withdraw things. So my darling wife, no rock this Christmas from me. <laughs> we can make up later. No, but no, no, she's a, she's a good woman. She don't put no pressure on me for no rock. No rock. Never, ever. She never asked me for a rock. Any rock she got, I chose the rock. So now it's time to sell the rock. I guess when I go home, she can lock the bedroom door. Click. <laughs> Don't come in here, touch nothing. Here. But look at God's list. We've made oil more important than water. And you can't drink oil. Okay, let me just close with this. Write this down. Genesis 128. God says, I bless you. It's after he showed them all this stuff now. He says, I bless you. And he said to them, be fruitful. That's number one. Multiply. That's number two. Replenish. That's number three. And then subdue. And when you do those four things, he says, you have dominion over the earth. He showed us how to dominate. First, you must be fruitful. Then you must what? Multiply. And then you must what? Replenish. And then you must what? Subdue. Write them down. Be fruitful means to produce. It doesn't mean to have children. The Greek, I mean, the, the Hebrew word here is very deep. It means to be productive, produce something. That command was given to Adam. Adam is the name of the whole species. He said, I want you, the first thing you must do to dominate is to produce something. That means every human being came to this earth with something to produce. Second instruction, write it down, multiply. Multiply means to reproduce. I'll give an example. Vicky is here this morning. Vicky have a gift of music. That's one of her gifts. Music. Great singer naturally. Heard on the radio this morning. Sounds so wonderful. Now, Vicky's voice is in her body. If Vicky could sing beautiful, excellent, articulate, with resonance, I mean beautiful pitch, but she dies. Or she stays in one room and sings. Can we benefit from her? So she dies with a gift in that room. But if she takes that gift and puts it in a form that can be multiplied, you got a CD? Never? No, okay. Keep it seat close. I had advertised, but too late now. Okay. See, so she got a CD, and the CD now has 30,000 copies. Same voice, same woman, same anointing, same song she wrote on 30,000 CDs. Now she has gone into number two. She's multiplied it. First she produced it. One, one song in the studio, one. She produced one. Then they took it and they reproduce it. That's what the word means, to multiply. Then she got to move to number three. Replenish. Replenish means to distribute. God says, Adam, if you want to have power of dominion in the earth with your gift, you must distribute it. Serve it. Get it out to the market. If you don't follow God's plan, you'll go poor. You can have a good idea. You can reproduce it. Stock it up in a warehouse and still die from poverty. Matter of fact, all you business people know in this room that the number one burden on business is inventory. Inventory is a killer of business. Inventory means your fruit is stored up. Can't get to the market. You got to get rid of it. That's distribution. That's God's idea. And when you distribute it, he says the third level is to subdue. Subdue means to control your market. You become the dominator in the market. And that's why the result will be dominion. You dominate the market. You know, I, 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 I think about it. Please don't miss this message for the next two minutes because I want to pray for everybody. You think about every successful business in the world has followed God's plan 
except the saints. Let's do, for example, McDonald's burger franchise. Look at that list. They produce one beautiful fruit, Big Mac. Then they reproduce it, multiply it. They keep producing the same Big Mac everywhere in the world. Then they replenish it. They distribute it through what they call franchises. All over the world, these stores called McDonald's stores. That's a franchise. That's the distribution system. Then they become what? They subdue the market. That means no one makes uh, a Big Mac. No other company can make a Big Mac. They control the Big Mac market. So what? They dominate the burger market with their Big Mac. Bill Gates, every year, he makes one fruit. Peter Stephen Jobs, every year, he produces one fruit. Then he multiplies it. Bill Gates multiplies it. Then they what? Distribute. Then they what? They control the market. God says everybody's supposed to do that. That's the key to surviving crisis. You gotta manage your resources and find your fruit. Let me give you a couple of uh, hints. God told Adam to what? Be fruitful. Everybody say, be fruitful. Be say it loud. Be fruitful. be fruitful. Say it again. Be fruitful. be fruitful. Say it louder. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. All the way in the back. Shout it. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. Hit your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, be fruitful. Be fruitful. Hit him again. Say, be fruitful. be fruitful. Hit him hard. Say, be fruitful. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. Say it again. Be fruitful. Be fruitful. Say, be fruitful. be fruitful. Tell him, God, say, be fruitful. Be Hit him one more time. Say, be fruitful. Be fruitful. One more time, say, be fruitful. be fruitful. Did you realize? He said, be fruitful. He never said to be seedful. And that's important. What comes first? The fruit or the seed? The seed. God looks at you and he simply says, be fruitful. <laughs> he didn't ask you to go find seed. God's assumption is that you are carrying seed. There are 6.7 billion seed containers on earth. One of them is sitting in your chair right now. You did not come to earth empty. God will never demand what he didn't supply. He'll never request what he didn't inject. God says, be fruitful. He's implying, I gave you seed. That means you're carrying something you can produce to make you successful on the earth. It's in you. The seed principle is interesting, eh? He says, I put the seed of everything in itself. That includes you, he says. I sent you to earth, and your seed is in you. Your future is in you. And that, that's why seed possesses fruit within itself. So you came to earth with your seed that has fruit in it that you're supposed to multiply. You know, if you plant a mango seed in the Bahamas, you will never get a mango back. You get hundreds, thousands. Why? It's the same fruit, but it multiplies. Why? It has to distribute. Seed possess fruit, but not for itself. And this is the philosophy of leadership of Jesus Christ. Whatever you were born with is not for you. Say it. Whatever you were born with is not for you. Say it again. <laughs> you came to earth to serve us something. You've been looking all over the place trying to find business. And you were born with business on the inside. 
No one on this earth is a mistake. You came here to deliver something that we need and you carry it. You cannot find it in school. It's not in university. It's not in any book. It's trapped in you. God hid your prosperity in a place where he knew you couldn't miss it. And we go looking for it everywhere. He said, you must be fruitful. There's a seed in you. The problem is we are not in the right environment. One thing with seed, it needs the right environment. That's why coming to this meeting today is important because my passion in life is to create an environment wherever I go for seeds to germinate. Do you feel yours germinating right now? Inside of you is an idea that the world needs. And I hope every time you come around me, I will tug on your seed to become a fruit and make you want to do something great. Why? Because you need the right environment. You can do anything. I tell you, you are awesome. But you got to stay away from seed killers. There are some people I avoid because they are seed killers. There's some friends who ain't friends. They'll talk you out of your orchard. In the name of Jesus, today make a decision that during this, what they call crisis, you are going to bear an orchard. You're going to become so much in demand, they're going to come to you in the midst of crisis and make you rich. Write this down. Seed produces after its kind. Inside of you is something that is screaming to be delivered. And sometimes you got to have trial and error, you know, before you hit it. But once you hit it, it's yours. I, I, I was thinking about this. A seed is a gift. God does not give bread. He gives seed. Please don't miss this last portion. Everybody say, God doesn't give bread. He gives seed. All right, here you are. You're hungry, right? You're hungry. Yippee! You're hungry. And you're praying for bread. Oh, Lord, I need some food. I need to eat. God said, okay. Look at this. God answers you. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower also supplies bread you're praying for bread God gives you seed listen to me you're praying for bread you're praying for money God don't give you money money's bread God don't give you money you pray for bread. God don't give you food. He gives you seed. He that supplies seed supplies bread. Look at the next st statement. He says, and he supplies a store of what? Seed, not a store of bread. Oh, help me get this out before I go. You're not going through crisis if you got the seed. Crisis will kill you if you got bread. Oh, I feel so useless sometimes. Do you understand what I'm talking about? If I give you a loaf of bread, you're in trouble. Because once you eat that, that's why God don't give you bread. If I give you seed, You live forever. Stop praying for bread. Some of you came here today. Things are a little tough. God tell me to tell you. It ain't tough. You just ain't thinking enough. You don't need money. She called my son he will give you a store of seed and he'll enlarge what? Your harvest. 
You pray for harvest because no, no, no. I don't give harvest. I give seed and the seed produce the harvest. And when you want more harvest, I give you more seed. You still ain't get it. Me, I am immune to crisis. I say it to the devil face. You will not touch me and my family. Why? I don't deal in bread. He that give it seed will increase your store of seed. And then he says, you will be made rich. Let me tell you something. Millions of people are about to become poor. You don't hear me? It started already. There are those in here who have lost their jobs. There are millions watching this program. You've lost your job. And your whole life was built on your job. And God said that was bread. Yes. Yes. You will be made rich if you have seed. Not bread. Watch the other part. So that you will be able to give. Generously. When, 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 say it loud, when, 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 say it loud, everybody, when, how many times, how many times, he said there'll never be a bad week, some of you cannot give offerings today, can't pay tithes, because you ain't got nothing, because if you understand my principle, you will always have tithes and offerings, you'll be able to give to the poor, every time. If you ask for bread, I mean you, me, me and you together, I want a piece of your bread. And after we eat this bread, we're going to die. Sounds familiar? So a woman said to her son, son, that's all we got. We got a meal. Huh? We can eat this cola and that's it. God says, look, this woman needs seed. So she sends to her house a prophet named Elijah. Why? He's a seed giver. Glory, hallelujah. He said, woman, uh, first, give me, plant, plant something. Lord have mercy. You, all you got is bread. Turn into a seed. Let me tell you something. Corn is seed. Green beans is seed. Peas is seed. You can boil them or plant them. She was about to boil them. Elijah said, turn it into a seed. Let's plant it. Plant it into my life. And she said, oh boy, it's a chance I'm taking. Let me tell you something. I'll never forget my father in the faith, Al Roberts. Al Roberts said to us way back in 1976 in chapel, I'll never get it. He says, when you're down to your last, turn it into a seed. As a student, I, I caught it. I couldn't pay my tuition. The money I had left, I'd say, here's what he'd say. He'd say, if it can't meet your need, turn it into a seed. Say it. Wow. As a student, I would just give what I had left. I said, God, this guy pay me tuition anyhow, so I might as well give it. And I would go in front of the chapel, we'd have offering time, we'd give it. <laughs> and friends, two days later, from nowhere, envelope appears in my mailbox with twice as much as I need for tuition, with no name on it. You don't need bread, bread is a killer. You need seed. Write this down. Everyone possesses a seed. Number two, your seed is your purpose and your passion. Number three, your seed contains your future. Number four, in every seed there is a forest. Number five, your seed is the ideas that won't go away. Seeds are what? 
ideas. You pray for bread, God gives you an idea. You pray for money, God gives you an idea. You pray for more resources, God gives you an idea. But you see, we are so lazy. The laziest people I've met are Christian people. Lazy. They love miracles. I pray for money, send someone to bring it. God said, no, I'm going to give you an idea to go clean cars. <laughs> we pray for God to take away the effort. Because we're lazy. God doesn't give bread, he gives seed. You ask God for more promotion, God says, okay, tell you what to do. Come to work earlier. Leave later and don't ask for overtime pay. Let them see your dedication. No, 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 no. I say I want promotion. I want more money. Because you, you didn't hear what I said. I just gave you a seed. Let me tell you what crisis is for. Creativity. Amen. Write it down. That's your job for the next two years. Creativity. God is the first name given to God in the Bible is creator he creates things out of nothing he says, now you just like me imitate your father like their children I want you to look at what they call a mess and I want you to turn it into a bless they call it lack I want you to turn it into plenty I want you to take the situation and think You all saw CNN the other day when they had the, the hologram yes. and the guy appeared. Yes. Yeah, well, the fellow who invented that came to visit me. I tell him I want shares in that. No one was interested in at the time, so I bought some shares. <laughs> when I saw it on CNN, I said, yeah. yeah. See, that's an idea. The guy had an idea. I know ideas. I invested in the idea. Yes. By the way, that's public knowledge now. There I go. When you are with people, this week during the conference, talk to plenty of people. During the networking times, when you're in the hall, introduce yourself to people. Get to know new people. Why? They are carrying ideas. I said to my members, come to the summit. And said, hey, okay, okay, no problem. Stay poor. The wealth has come to you. Wealth is not money. It's ideas. Connect with ideas. Invest in ideas. Because ideas are seeds. He that give it seeds to the sower. Your seed determines your natural talents. That's why your wealth is, is something that you like. The world is actually looking for your seed, but in fruit form. When you go to a mango tree, do you go to eat the seed? No, you go for the fruit. The world needs your seed put in fruit form. You don't eat mango seeds. You eat mangoes. You want the fruit. So here's one, this one I figured out years ago. Your seed is your business. Every woman and every man in this room is a businessman, a businesswoman. You are a businessman, a businesswoman. Your business is your seed. And all your other businesses grow out of that seed. The ideas that you pray for, God gives you. God drops ideas in your head. Palmer's Faith Ministries was an idea. I got an idea. There was no one walking in the room, no, no spirit of God. Going, Miles, I want you to begin a ministry. No! I had an idea. Look, 
got the idea. It's a global ministry. What are you waiting for? Bread. That's the problem. The problem with seed is first you got to die. Every seed dies before it becomes a tree. And then you got to go through years of growth and development, which you ain't got patience for. You want fruit now. You know, I think about you, Brother Charlie, this week. I read the papers. You know, you plan to expand and go uh, to where? Huh? Atlanta. Opening a store in Atlanta. You know, Charlie came to me years ago in my office. He had this little piece of paper. He said, Dr. Miles Monroe, Pastor, I got this idea for the store. I looked at it. He says, I'm going to create my own brand name. But I want my own name on the clothes. I said, man, that's an idea. I said, son, go for it. He came back. He showed me some samples. I said, man, this is beautiful. Go for it. Now he's one of the leading fashion suppliers in our country. <laughs> Sitting right there. Stand up, young man. Stand up. Give him a hand for being a bold idea. He had an idea. Now he's going to expand to Atlanta. Bigger markets, bigger opportunities. And then Paris next, my son. And then London, got to look for you, buddy. And go on to Rome, my son. And go all the way to Nigeria. Sell your wares. Why? Ideas pre present fruit. And fruit present seed. And seed produce trees. Trees produce fruit with seeds with trees. It keeps on growing. But you got to bear the first fruit. Tell your neighbor I feel pregnant. <laughs> Repeat after me. Here's a confession. Tell your neighbor I am a solution. <laughs> Say it again. I am a solution. <laughs> Say it loud everybody. I am a solution. <laughs> Shout it loud. I am a solution. <laughs> I want everybody to say it. I am a solution. <laughs> Scream it to the roof. I am a solution. Say it again. I am a solution. You were born to solve a problem on earth. Number two. You are God's response to a need he created on earth. Number three. You are the answer to a question that God knew would be asked in your generation. That's why you came here. You are a solution. Number four, you are the fulfillment of one of God's desires. God desired something on earth during this very generation and you are the answer to this desire. There's something he wanted done and it made you necessary. You didn't come here to make a living, pay bills, and die. You came to deliver something to this earth. You came to solve a problem, answer a question. Matter of fact, number five, you are an assignment that your generation needs to experience. That's why I'm so impressed with Barack Obama. Somewhere, they say, you are a junior, not, not senior, junior senator you are a junior senator only governors run for president you are you're not a senator you are a junior he said look I felt when I looked at my country and I looked at its position in the world I felt that no one had the answers and I saw the answers so as a junior senator, I am announcing today my candidacy for the President of the United States. They said, that's impossible. Junior senator. He believed he was a solution. How about you? I say, how about you? I say, how about you? They say, you're too young. No, tell them, I ain't too young. You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it while I'm young so I can do it long. Write this down. You are necessary. Say it. I am necessary. I am necessary. Say it again. I am Say it loud. I am One more time. I 
Oh, come on, shake the roof for me. I am necessary. Tell your neighbor to the face. Come on, tell him to the face. I am necessary. Tell your neighbor, you need what I got. Say it again. I am necessary. You need what I got. Tell your neighbor, the world is waiting on me. And I will deliver. Clap your hands, all you seed givers, and become fruit. So Jesus said, give yourself to the world and you'll become great. He said, whoever wants to be great must serve themselves to the world. Whoever wants to be first must become a slave to their gift. That's what this week is about. Finding that seed, that gift to serve to the world. The seed. Look at the beautiful people in this place. Look at the powerful forest. I have in my hand right now, I have in my hand right now, let's see. I have in my hand right now, uh, please imagine this, a mango seed, mango seed. Of my hand. Is this useful to you? A mango seed. Can you eat this? No. Can it give you nutrients? And can you eat this and for a meal? This is useless. That's about how most of us are. We exist. We're present. People can't benefit. And so I take this seed and I plant it. The seed begins to grow a tree. And then it becomes a beautiful tree. Hundreds of mangoes. Is it useful? Yes. Can it give you nutrients? Yes. Now here's something about, about trees. This is very important about trees. Hallelujah. Mm. Trees never bring their mangoes to you. Mm. Trees don't have to advertise their mangoes. No promotions on the radio or nothing. They don't hand out cards and brochures to get people to come and make them preach. They just bear their fruit. You know what happens when you bear your fruit? They come looking for you. They'll fly around the world to come eat your fruit. This week, Today is the first session of the conference. This is where we headed all week. We got some great examples coming to speak to us. People who took their seed and turned it into a tree. We got demonstrations of people who, who, are, who are stories of seeds becoming trees. They're not afraid of the crisis. Because fruit is number one. Then water. Then gold. And then you get oil. And you can buy your jewelry. Please start with the fruit.
Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.